Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Facebook premiere. Um, my name is Sam Tchaikovsky, and I'm the Sales and Marketing Manager for Wound Care People. And I'm just going to be running through a quick introduction to today's session and our speakers before passing you over to them. So today's session is called T uh, Demystifying the Management of Leg Ulceration with Lower Limb Swelling. And our speakers today are Leanne Atkin, who's a vascular nurse consultant at the Mid-Yorkshire NHS Trust and a lecturer at the University of Huddersfield. And we also have Rebecca Elwell, who is uh, MSc Lymphedema and a Macmillan Lymphedema AMP and team leader. Welcome, guys. Um, today's session is sponsored by Essity, so a big, big thank you to them. Uh, we will be posting links to the certificates at the end of, of, uh, of this video, so um, keep an eye out for those. And we'll also post the recording and the slides on our website, and you'll be able to watch the recording back at any time here on our Facebook page. So uh, without further ado, I will pass you over to Leanne. Uh, thanks very much and enjoy the session. Hi, thanks for those introductions, Sam. I'm absolutely delighted to be here tonight. Um, as mentioned, my name's Leanne. I'm a vascular nurse consultant at Mid York's NHS Trust. Um, and I'm here with a great friend of mine this evening, uh, Rebecca, to be able to talk to you about how we demystify the management of leg ulceration when we're thinking about leg ulceration combined with that common lower limb swelling. This um, Facebook premiere is slightly different. Me and Becky wanted to really give you a bit of an informal chat uh, rather than a overarching session to really help to give some little brain worms inside you, if you like, to get you thinking within your clinical practice. But we thought that we really needed to just provide an overview of the basics, if you like, what we're talking about to set the context really of our later conversations. And I'm a lecturer, so I love providing you learning objectives at the start of anything that I do, but hopefully at the end of this session, you'll really appreciate why the National Wound Care Strategy is required and how you can really think about how you implement that within your own local practice really thinking about where does that edema fit into that leg ulcer and how do we target that edema with our known therapies and that most important therapy called strong compression therapy. So these slides are presented quite a bit these days in terms of when anybody's delivering a session on lower limb wounds. But I still start all of my sessions off in this because I think it's really important to bring home the size of the burden that the NHS is currently facing. Who would have thought before this data by Julian Guest that actually wounds would be up there in the top spends across the NHS? I didn't think that we would spend more money on wound care than what we do treating obesity, but we currently do. And the difficulty is, is that the numbers are increasing year on year and not just by small amounts. From 2012 to 2017, there was nearly an extra 3.5 billion patients added to our caseloads. Now, I know that there weren't an extra 3.5 billion patients across our network. And the worrying thing for me is that the fact that the number of chronic defined wounds has increased from 43% to 49%. So this actually tells us that we're getting worse rather than better. And that's alarming. And that's one of the reasons why the National Wound Care Strategy has been set up. And they have provided us some fantastic, clear recommendations of how we should be clinically managing our patients with lower limb wounds. And I absolutely love these guidelines. I urge you all to download them and have them of your aid memoir of how you're going to treat patients with lower limb ulceration. What I think though is really important to remember is that when we're talking about lower limb ulceration, there is always going to be a combination factor between the arteries, the lymphatic system and the venous system, just by the way that our bodies are designed. I love these two diagrams because I think it really brings it home that as much as arteries and veins are separate systems, in the middle is a capillary bed, a complex network of structures where the gaseous exchange takes place. 
but within that capillary network there is running through a, a huge amount of filtration of the lymphatic system and that's why when we think about venous disease we can never think about that in isolation of edema because these things go hand in hand if you've got venous hypertension you will have a backfill and congestion within that capillary bed that will then impact on your uh, lymphatic's ability to be able to drain so all of this really starts us to think about does every patient with venous disease have a degree of lymphedema and issues with lymphatic insufficiency and I think the answer to that has to be yes. We know that edema with lower limb is distressing and it makes our job much more complex. But let's not just forget that edema in itself is hugely impactful to a patient's quality of life. If any of you have spent hours like me on Zoom calls sitting at a desk, many of you maybe experience the mild degree of swelling. I certainly am. And I can tell you my legs feel more heavy, more tired, more tender towards the end of the day, just by that tiny amount of mild edema. Imagine though, if that became more in terms of progressive edema, where it started to affect the skin, the shape, the appearance of your legs. It starts to impact on your ability to move and flex your ankle joint, your choice of footwear, the choice of clothing. And then if you had skin changes, wouldn't you be constantly worried about the weeping of the skin, the blistering, the insect bite, that fear of that ulceration. And then if you do have that ulceration, I would be petrified of developing an infection. And I think sometimes we forget the impact of the edema and the ulceration on the patient's quality of life but also the mental health. If you have a patient with a venous leg ulcer, an open wound on their lower leg and edema of their lower leg, all of what I've described, you can put plus 10 because it all becomes worse in terms of the impact of their quality of life. And we know that there is a huge cascade and cycle of edema, that many edema starts relatively soft and pitting. What do we do as healthcare professionals when you have new soft and pitting edema? Nothing. We turn a blind eye, we actively ignore that. We just say, oh well, your legs are a little swollen. How disgraceful is that? There is an opportunity there for initial prevention to stop this cascade because what happens after that soft pitting edema is that you start to get fibrosis of the tissues, which will actually impede on the nutrients of the skin, causing that skin changes, the risk of eczema, the risk of hyperkeratosis and lipodermosclerosis, and that overall inflammation that you see. These pictures here, many of them would describe as having cellulitis. None of them have got a bacterial or an infective element to them. That is simply inflammation within the tissue because of the constant cycle of that edema and venous hypertension. So what do we need to do about all of that? Well, actually, the management has to be strong compression therapy. Compression therapy is one of the things within nursing that we have got high level of evidence. Probably one of the only things to tell you the truth that we have got good systematic reviews, meta-analysis to say that compression therapy heals patients with venous leg ulceration. We know more and more about compression's um, action in terms of it has got a targeted anti-inflammatory nature, not just about the chronic inflammation of the wound bed, but the chronic inflammation of the subcutaneous tissues. It therefore helps to break down that cycle of that edema and inflammation. It actually targets that capillary bed where we describe that congestion taking place. Within compression, though, we are very fortunate today that we have lots of options in terms of variations of compression, many aids in terms of how a patient can apply it themselves. And we know quite clearly that compression therapy can improve a patient's quality of life. And that's a patient with a wound or without a wound. 
Compression therapy works by many ways. It helps to really focus on reducing the amount of um, exudate from that venous leg ulcer. It also helps to target that soft edema, trying to increase that ability for that lymphatic system to be able to uptake that additional fluid. It will help to provide that comfort of that patient by reducing the chronic inflammation inside. It targets directly the venous hypertension by making that calf muscle pump much more effective. And all of this helps to break down that chronic repetitive cycle and actually get a patient on a healing trajectory by reducing the volume of edema, reducing that congestion in that capillary bed and really targeting that venous hypertension. I've worked in leg ulceration now for too many years to remember. I can remember that when compression bandaging was first um, used, the only person that could apply it was Mr. Curley, my vascular consultant. Things have come a long way since then. We've got fantastic innovations such as two layer kits that you can't over compress, or we've got bandages with guides on them. We have specific bandages targeted for edema management. We have compression garments that have been designed to provide the same amount of compression as a traditional four layer bandage. And we are constantly innovating in terms of weave, knit, and how compression can be provided. And don't think the future stops here. There's many exciting things happening within university benches that will be able to revolutionize the compression field even further. But for me, there are some really good, useful things that's out there. Compression bandaging still has to be part of your armory, but compression hosiery kit has a great option in terms of providing the same amount of compression needed, but allowing that patient to take some ownership of their own care, to be able to have some choice when they bath or they shower. Compression wrap systems also have a beauty of being able to reshape some quite significantly congested legs. But my favorite things are things like toe caps and foot wraps. So we can target the edema that often exists on the foot. Way, way back in the time, we used to think there were no compression should be applied on the foot. Luckily, that myth has been busted. If you don't apply compression onto the foot, all you'll get is chronic lymphedema of your toes. Um, and we need to ensure that that's targeted. But compression hosiery selection sometimes can be a little bit difficult. And it can be difficult in terms of the wide variation of products that's out there for you. And actually what we hope to do by the end of this session is to really demystify some of those current myths and some of those challenges that you face day to day. All of our future discussions that we're gonna have this evening is all though based on these foundations. It's about ensuring your patient has that holistic assessment to number one, determine their suitability for compression and also really think about that patient's ability to apply and remove that compression. It's then thinking about what do you want to gain from that compression from that leg? How much compression is needed? We often talk about 40 milligrams of mercury pressure being the optimum. Can I just say that that to me is the minimum for a patient with a venous leg ulcer? Sometimes you will need much more compression than that to target that venous hypertension in certain patients. There has to be an element of patient's choice with this. We have to bring patients on board in their decision-making. And then it's about assessing the most appropriate hosiery that's out there in terms of type and, and fit that we have. There are many compression hosiery choices, and sometimes even I get confused about this. How many brands are there? How many classifications? How many types of knits? Should it be open toe, closed toe? What's the advantage to all of those? Some of these comes with zips, and there is a huge array of colors available, application aids. And really, how many compression garments should you provide to each and every patient? And hopefully some of these confusions is gonna formulate our discussion this afternoon. The one thing though that I urge you all to get your head round is that the classification of compression, because there are a number of different standards used by the manufacturers within the UK. Some of those are actually 
classed as the British classification. And some of those use a European type classification such as the RAL system. And actually that provides a different level of compression depending on what garment that you choose. And this is where me and Becky sometimes get confused. I think though, when we're talking about edema management with venous leg ulceration, to me, this is where it gets slightly simpler. Because if you've got any form of edema on a leg, you need to be choosing a compression garment that has got a European type standard behind it. So either the French standard, the German standard, the RAL standard, we shouldn't be using the British standard. That's simply because you get a lesser compression value, as you can see on this table, by that British standard. And for any patients with edema, by default, they need a higher level of compression. So on top of the level of compression, though, there's something about a stiffness index. And this is how the garment is fitted um, to the leg. And we're going to really dive down into why is this so important in terms of edema management. And it's really important because actually if you get a stretchy garment, it will move with you. I like to think of those as like my Spanx, they move with you. But actually if you get a garment that's a flat knit, which is very stiff indeed, it's like your old fashioned corsets that your ladies used to wear that provides a stiffness and therefore doesn't allow the edema to rebound in the same way. So it has lots of clinical advantages. With compression though, we really need to think about this as a start of a relationship with our patients. We need to aim to get it right first time, but do you know what? With many of my patients, I don't get it right first time. For many of my patients, we have to have a repeat assessment to think about, is this the most appropriate garment for you? We need to really empower our patients to take responsibility. This edema is not going to go away. Even if you treat their underlying venous disease, if you've got chronic edema, it's going to be there for the rest of your life. We need to think about how we encourage patients to think about their wider health, take responsibility of that compression, and really start to be in a relationship with their compression, that they enjoy wearing it day in, day out. Our therapeutic relationships that we have with our patients is the key to that increased concordance. And that ultimately is a fantastic way to reduce the burden on the NHS, reduce the spend on, from the NHS, but also improve the patient's quality of life. There are many factors that impact on a patient's wearing a compression, and we need to be skilled in all of these areas. We need to be thinking about that patient preference, their underlying obesity, their limb shape, the patient's ability, the skin condition and their overall determination of their understanding of this compression. We need to try our best to get this right. And there's a huge challenge here because I really believe that prevention is better than cure. The sooner we get these patients into therapeutic compression, the sooner that we make that engagement of their brain with that compression, the best chance we have to stop that deterioration, to stop that chronic edema becoming worse, to heal that venous leg ulcer. And we really need to be focusing on that stopping of this deterioration. I hope that this session's provided you a little bit of the background and a little bit of the thought process to what we're gonna talk about next. So I would like to welcome Becky onto my fantastic friend's sofa. And basically we're gonna have a bit of an informal chat of some of the conversations that we've had between ourselves as clinicians and um, within a staff room or with patients. Because actually some of this isn't so black and white and some of this still requires me and Becky to do a bit of head scratching. Hi Becky, it's lovely Hi. to see you. You um, too. I, I, and it looks like you're actually doing some clinical work uh, rather than me being at home today. <laughs> yeah, apologies uh, here at work, mask in situ. I guess this is the same for most of us uh, in our work days. So uh, yeah, great to see you at home and, and mask free. But yeah, this is the reality. We can hear you loud and clear though, Becky. So that's the most important thing. And, oh, and like that's said, great. You know, it's great that the world is getting back to normal. But, you know, for us within the NHS and many other healthcare services, 
we're still masked up, goggled up, uh, full PPE, and it's still a, a challenging place at times. Yeah. So I, I just wanted this, uh, Becky, to be a little bit informal and, and really, you know, really try to get inside your brain um, because I know you come at this from a lymphedema, edema specialist point of view. And as much as I've just delivered that session, as you know, and I play a little bit with edema, but I wouldn't ever call myself a lymphedema specialist. I'm a vascular specialist, so much more of the arteries and the vein side uh, rather than anything else. But I can tell you, I really struggle with this sometimes with my patients. Um, and I think one, one of my challenges is um, I often, after healing a patient with a venous leg ulcer, let's say that I've healed them in a compression bandage. Um, I often then think about, oh, okay, I'll just get you some off the shelf stockings, size large, off the shelf, some type of manufacturer. Do you think that that's the, the right thing or actually it, 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 is that the wrong approach at that time? I think it's it's really um, difficult to have one approach. And I think you alluded to that so brilliantly in the presentation about patient choice and about us needing to have a, a wealth of knowledge and experience around compression. So I wish there was a, a simple answer, but, but ultimately healing a patient in compression bandages and then trying to find a garment, that's really one of the biggest downfalls that we have because what we do is we uh, see a light at the end of the tunnel that this patient is going to be moved on from our services and needing us and hopefully their long-term option will be their compression hosiery and inevitably what happens is um, stockings get a really bad name because the patient goes into hosiery their skin breaks down again it's seen as being the, the hosiery's fault as it were um, and then the, the compression bandaging has to start again and often that's um, as you state in the presentation due to the wrong compression uh, strength being selected so it might be that a British standard has been selected so there's, there's been this beautiful 40 millimeters of mercury or more compression bandaging healing the leg ulcer and then we drop down to a 17 millimeters of mercury British standard class one hosiery garment so it's not going to give that support um, but also it might be because as you said the fabric choice is not right for that individual patient so an off-the-shelf garment may not be the right approach it may be that the patient has lipodermatous sclerosis so they've got um, a, a narrowing of the lower part um, of their leg and therefore that means that any stocking is going to telescope and fall down therefore a made-to-measure stocking would be far more appropriate and that could still be in a circuit knit it may be that 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 is appropriate for that patient or it may be that actually if there's an edema component there as you stated about the higher strengths that are made to measure um, flat knit style garments so for anyone who's not sure about that a circular garment is knitted in the round like a pair of tights would be and a flat knitted garment is knitted on a knitting machine and then sewn together with a seam which gives a more anatomical shaping so usually the flat knit garment is the garment of choice for patients with edema um, and and it gives a higher stiffness, as you spoke about, but also it gives more contouring um, to the leg shape. So it actually allows any skin folds rather than to be um, tourniqueted to sit over those skin folds um, and skin changes to be much more comfortable. So I think from a lymphedema perspective, we would agree with you that it's not just about the strength. It's also about the, the style. And I think it's really important though, Becky, because me and you talk about lymphedema and edema, and sometimes we're talking about it like it's two separate entities. But in fact, all, when you talk about lymphedema, it means that they've had a formal diagnosis of lymphedema. Yeah. But actually we need to treat all our patients with those types of, of, of narrative of lymphedema, because if you've got edema by default, you've got lymphatic insufficiency. Yeah. Just because you haven't had a lymphocytography and an, a formal diagnosis. So, that, that leads me to think, well, should all patients with any form of edema be put in flat knit garments? Yes, <laughs> I think it's really important um, that the the discussions that we talk um, about wound care now, as you um, showed with the uh, lovely pictures from the anatomy of the lymphatics intertwined in the capillary bed, there isn't one system without the other. You know, wound care management has for so long been um, uh, exclusive without lymphedema management, without lymphatic involvement. Um, and the things that have happened with the National Wound Care Strategy, but primarily with the work that you've done as 
part of Legs Matter, you've brought together the organizations that represent vascular um, and lymphatics. And therefore, we finally talk now from the same page, which we've always wanted to. All edema that's visible is lymphatic. So therefore, any swelling is lymphedema. It doesn't matter whether we call it lymphedema, chronic edema or oedema. It's all the same thing. Some of the terms are confusing, but you can feel confident if you can see swelling, that is a lymphedema. And therefore, we should be approaching every patient with the same high level quality of care. And if that's a flat knit garment for that patient that's made to measure and bespoke for them, you will get better long term outcomes. And don't you think, though, sometimes we just use all of these terminologies sometimes just to confuse the juniors within them? And, and I love those simple take home messages that all edema is lymphedema, you know, and, 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 and obviously love the plug for Legs Matters. As you know, uh, I'm the current chair of the Legs Matters campaign. I re represent the Society of Vascular Nurses. Becky and Margaret sit on the Legs Matters campaign representing the BLS. Uh, we love uh, the same song sheet. And this is re one of the reasons why we like doing big things like this together. And I urge you all, if you haven't been onto the Legs Matters website, have a look. There's lots and lots of resources there for you. But just going back to, to what you were saying then, Becky, the, the, you know, so if I see a patient, I think there's a couple of things. I, I think you're completely right that I see a patient and they're healed. I see that as end of my journey. It's my discharge yeah. point. When when can I get rid of them? Um, <laughs> And, 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 you know, and that often getting rid of them, Becky, in, in today's nursing world, leg ulcer world is you are now healed. I'm going to give you a prescription for a hosiery. When that comes, you can take off your bandage and put your stocking on. With, with no nurse involvement, no check of fit, uh, no nothing. And, and that's the reality. Uh, mm. what, what, what do you think of the current reality? <laughs> I think it's the start of the patient's journey is is that their, their long term um, maintenance and care and in lymphedema management obviously we've generally leaned towards the fact that because it's a lifelong condition generally we've not discharged patients of course I'm well aware of services who have patients who've been well maintained for five or six years so moving them into a, a self management pathway is perfectly acceptable but I think I struggle massively with the healing and then handing the patient over with a prescription for a garment, as you said, that's never, ever been fitted or the problems discussed with it. So they inevitably end up in a drawer, multiple pairs because they're prescribed every every three months or every four months and they just pile up and pile up. I think that leg ulcer hosiery kits have enabled us to introduce the concept of hosiery much earlier on in a patient's journey. And I think you're far more successful um, in those patients who've been wearing hosiery for a long time um, during their healing, pro well, hopefully not too long a time in the healing process. Um, now we're following the lower in recommendations for the National Wound Care Strategy, but actually by introducing that hosiery early, people get used to wearing it. They get used to the problems that um, are um, familiar to anyone who wears compression hosiery daily, um, things like the washing, getting them dry in time and things like that. So I think that's a great um, tick, if you like, for us using our, our, our leg ulcer hosiery kits as a first option where, where it's possible to do so. However, I think that when we're prescribing hosiery for patients, it should be absolutely essential that that patient continues with nursing care until they are in a garment which is suitable which enables them to self-manage otherwise I think you're setting them up for failure. Absolutely and, and I for many years you, you can remember the, the Atkin and Tickle pathway that we put together we stepped down everybody that when we could into some form of compression hosiery kit to do that exact thing that you've said to be with them for the last yeah. six weeks of their yeah. healing journey to help to firefight any problems, yeah. such as application aids, it might be just a simple prescription for an application aid, but, and, but to look at that and, and also to brain train that patient that it's the garment that's making you heal. You have to carry on with the garment forever. And, and you know, even all of the compression hosiery kits were based on Venus 6, uh, sorry, yeah. Venus 4. And even in Venus 4, they saw that there was less recurrence of patients yeah. with a hosiery kit than there was with healing and with the compression bandage yeah. and then transferring them. And I'm sure that's down to the brain training and having that nurse to firefight some of those issues. Yeah. So, so from my point of view, from when I've healed a patient with a venous leg also, one of the common things that happens, so, so we do often try to get away first off with a with an off the shelf um, compression garment. And I'm hearing actually that's probably the wrong thing to do. 
but sometimes you can get away with a compression hosiery off the shelf garment yeah. but many patients that come to see me report digging in on the ankle crease yeah. or indentation at the top around the rim what's that telling me then becky from a therapeutic point of view that is that the stocking is not right for that individual. If I had an uncomfortable pair of socks on, I'd take them off. And I certainly wouldn't wear them again. They'd be at the back of the sock drawer uh, and that's where they'd stay. So, uh, you know, we have to think about is we all have a comfy pair of socks. We all have a comfy bra. We all have comfy pants. They might have holes in and they're still comfy. So we stick with them. You know, that's what we talk to our patients about. There is a garment that, that will be right, that they will love, that will become their holy pair of pants. Um, but you're right. You, you wouldn't wear it. It's not the right stocking uh, and actually if you think about the area at the front ankle crease where your foot naturally bends at your your lower leg then that is an area where that really does have susceptibility to damage uh, from the garment if it's not right so that's where using some of the flat knit garments where you sit over that area and measuring obliquely around the base of the heel and the front ankle fold for that custom fit measurement can give you a really comfortable fit and and some of the innovations that the companies offer. So they offer flexion um, around the ankle and they offer um, things like a T-heel where it can be knitted much more anatomically. Um, you can start to build those in. The big issue around the top of the stocking just below the knee, that for me is a massive problem. Um, I think that's very common in circular knit hosiery. I think that it's really common for patients to turn it over. How many times do we see patients who roll it down so that it it's even tighter around that area, completely impeding that venous and lymphatic drainage and return and probably causing pooling in the leg and putting them at risk of further skin breakdown. And that uh, brings up this, the, the, the point that quite often um, alarms me um, is that a lot of community nurse training and treatment methodology is around the below knee only. And when you get patients referred to you, I know that you image the whole leg. You're looking at the lymphatic system, uh, sorry, the vascular system as it branches off from the groin. It is part of the whole body. And in lymphedema management, we will examine patients in their underwear. We need to see their hips, their buttons. Um, even their abdomen and genitalia, where does the swelling extend to? And therefore, if we use a below knee stocking in a patient who's had below knee bandaging, it may be that that's not the right choice going forward. You may be able to get away with below knee bandaging um, for the um, healing component of the ulceration, even though we would probably argue that the bandaging would be beneficial taken above the knee from a lymphedema perspective if there's swelling present. But certainly the longer term solution for hosiery should be for the whole of the leg. So, so you mentioned quite a few things to me there. First off, I think we take our messages. The hosiery goes to thigh as well. So if we have got any problems below the knee of that stocking, the initial thing that a generalist nurse needs to be thinking about is a leg compression in terms of thigh or tights at least. Yeah. I think that you've told me that if you've got digging in of the ankle crease, I'm needing flat knit and it's probably related to my edema in the first place. There's a couple of things though that you, you said, you started to, to really talk about some, let's call it specialist interventions in terms of these T-shapes and all the rest of it. But I just want to remind the audience that made to measure flat knit isn't specialist, is it? it it's everybody's business. And, and, and that in itself is just dead easy, isn't it? Yeah. All the manufacturers have a, a, their own web page. You, you download how to measure. They all come with a, instructions of measure. And, and I'll tell you now, Becky, for each one of those, I print those out each for each patient yeah. because it changes slightly with different yeah. manufacturers. So I print those out and I'm there with my tape measure and my assistant. We're, we're doing it as a, as a pair to do the measurements and to record them all at the same time. And it's not complex, is it, made to measure flatness? It, it's relatively easy isn't it? Is it, I find it easy it's so easy once you've done a few it's like everything everything's difficult when it's new and you've never done it and it's quite daunting when you get a form in front of you that's got half a dozen tick boxes 15 boxes for measurements and you, you've never done it so it seems really daunting and I have to say that using some of the um, videos that are online some of the YouTube videos some of the training videos that the companies offer are really good obviously we've been during a period of COVID 
we've not been able to have reps out to work with us we're not been in that position and in the acute trust for me that's still not an option but in some of the community settings they can be teams meetings online where you can get somebody to talk you through how to fill in the form which can be really easy we give the patients the form where they're capable shout out the measurements and get them to write them down get them involved would you like this option would you like this color you don't know what color it is right let's get it on youtube and show you the colors um, and get some involvement in that selection process i don't want something from the shops that somebody else has bought for me i want to go and choose it i want to see it i'd like to feel it and that's a bit of a problem with compression hosieries that you don't get to really feel before you buy but with the made to measure garments the more you're seeing them and seeing the excellent fit the more you portray that to your patients and i think that's something we've spoken about many times is as healthcare professionals we have a responsibility to be positive about compression if we're fearful of it if we've had a bad experience and if we're not confident with it we give off all the wrong vibes patients um, often come to the lymphedema service having had a poor past experience with compression they'll tell me they'll bring me half a dozen pairs when they next come they've got loads in the drawer that they've not worn and it's very hard then to ask someone to go along with that journey with you to try again um, and actually buy into that so I think that it is about your confidence with made to measure and I do believe that there's plenty of resources out there um, and I think that it's about trying to have a go um, even if that's supported through one of the companies on a colleague to start with just to get used to the form and how to do that. So again all of your answers make me want to ask you six questions never mind one. <laughs> um, so made to measure is, is anybody um, and I get that and I would reiterate just what you said you know I bought tights before from shops and I can't wear them. It don't mean I can't wear tights, I just don't like them. I like my tights quite high up over my rounded belly to stay where they want them to be. If the hips are tight, I'm waddling around like the penguin man by halfway through my clinic. That doesn't make me non-compliant, does it, with tights, just because I've got the wrong fit. And, and I think we, we need to really challenge that. So you said in that, that you know, some patients come to you, they've been given six garments. Do you think that patient's non-compliant then? Categorically, that word's banned in our service. <laughs> Non-compliant, non-concordant, whatever you want to call it, it's nonsense. I think it's about our perspective, uh, perspective, and I think it's about us, not about the patient at all. Um, and I think inevitably it's about the patient not being involved in that decision-making process, not being given informed choice. You know, we're starting this bandaging on you today, get your leg out. Well, no, I want to know why. Why are you doing it? What do you want to achieve? How long am I going to have it for? What are all the implications? So I think that that's something that you, you really are hitting on an important message there. And I think that the tights is a great option Option. You know, we've all had a, a, a pair of tights that's too short where your gussets around your knees and it gives you chafing on your thighs. And it doesn't mean that that isn't you're never going to find a pair of tights that's suitable for you. It actually means that if you build on all the shops and all the tights that are available, there will be multiple pairs that are, are right for you. You just haven't cracked on the right one yet. We introduce compression to patients saying that we probably won't get it right first time. I think that takes away the fact that you are the expert and it puts them in the driving seat. So what I say to them is there are so many options. I couldn't possibly get the one that's spot on for you this time. But don't worry if you don't like it, or you don't get on with it or for whatever reason, I'm not happy with the fit of it on you. Then we'll go for another one. And if we have to keep trying, we will keep trying. And although people could frown and say, well, that's very wasteful of resources, you've demonstrated with the figures. It is not a waste of resources to try a couple of options with someone. We don't think about that when we're changing dressings every three days, using dresses that are massively over overpriced, using uh, systems of bandaging which are not right for that individual. We don't dream of that. So for me, it's about putting the patient as the expert. They're at the centre of it. And we will find the right thing, but we might not get that first time. Compression should be, patients should be more comfortable in it than out of it there that's the important message when we talk about oh it might be uncomfortable no they're already living with the discomfort of an ulcer 
and swelling. That's uncomfortable. Therefore, this is a solution to their pain and an improvement. Take away the inflammatory component, you improve the patient's pain. So we always sell it as an analgesia. This garment is going to be the same as you taking eight paracetamol a day, but without taking them. And we know how much patients hate taking their, their pain relief. I also think you said, touched on something really important there about um, going to Marks and Spencer's and getting, you know, tights and they're not cheap. You know, you know, you go and buy your own support hosiery, you go and buy your own hosiery. It's not cheap. And I think there's an understanding there for patients as well around the fact that the Queen has her bras made at Rigby and Pella. People go to Savile Row for a made to measure suit. Why on earth should our patients who deserve the very best not have bespoke garments for them? Especially if their legs are not normal of shape well, well by default you know it, like you said it, you know if you were a five foot man who was probably 20 stone you wouldn't go and buy off the shelf suit it's never going to fit you you're going to have to pay for that tailoring of that suit so it's exactly the same with our patients and many of these patients haven't got you know beautiful shaped legs with a narrow ankle how many of us have? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe one, maybe twenty years ago or so, but certainly not, certainly not now. It, but I think I love your analogy of saying to patients, you know, I'm not going to get it right first time. It's going to take me some time to get that because actually, you, you're setting out on that beautiful relationship, aren't you? Of my door is open. I'm not going to discharge you. My door is open. My quest to you is to find you something that does feel comfortable that you want to wear. And I think we all need to ta start talking about the anti-inflammatory nature of compression uh, to get this to heal. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I think, you know, people are very happy to use tubes and tubes of anti-inflammatory gel with very little impact. Um, but actually, here's something that's proven. Like you said, it's it's really lovely to be a nurse talking about something that is researched. You know, like you, you said, we don't have much of that. So actually, what we can do is be really honest and say, I hand on heart know that this will work. If we can work together, we'll make it happen. Um, and I think from an edema perspective, that's where the, the compression is our kind of area of expertise so just like we would refer patients into your vascular services for help and advice regarding uh, a mixed etiology uh, ulcer it might be that they've got suspected pad after we've done an abpi it might be that actually that patient's got really um, heavy achy legs with varicose veins um, and i'd like to, to ask you a, about referral in a second but please don't I hesitate ever to ask your lymphedema colleagues um, if you've got a service near to you ask to come and spend some time to learn how to use those measurement forms to see flatten it in action um, you know do that people will be really really keen to work with you to get this right and use the expertise that's out there I, I can hear people screaming at us now Becky to say number one I haven't got a lymphedema service which is something that me and you can't solve it's something that legs matters hopefully will with their political angle but what can I ask you? So my local lymphedema service won't see a patient with a wound. And I know some lymphedema services have got a cut off BMI these days that if you've got a BMI over 35, you're not allowed into the lymphedema service. Can I ask you, what's your opinion on not accepting wounds or not accepting obese patients? I think I probably need to um, mask the whole of my face to speak truthfully about how I feel um, uh, as a as a, an NHS employee and a, and a trustee for the British Lymphology Society. I am appalled. I, I am appalled that that's the case. And I think that sadly, because the services are underfunded for lymphedema, as in so many other services for our community colleagues alike, I think that unfortunately that this is a, a rationing of care, which I do not agree with at all. And, and I'm completely with you. I think that we need to be standing up more to say that this is abhorrent. That these, you're causing harm. You know, these patients, if we can't manage them within community nursing teams or specialist nursing teams, and we need the help of a lymphedema yeah. specialist, I need your help, whether they've got a wound or they've not. And for the obese patients, I find it even worse because guess what's going to happen to those patients? They're just going to get, unfortunately, more of weight. And the legs are only going to get bigger. And eventually they'll start with lymphorrhea, they'll start with leg ulcer, and then we're all in a mess together. And, and, and I just think that we need to be very careful what messages we're giving these patients. We know that those rapid contacts that we can have with the patient to talk about more activation, losing weight, healthy lifestyles, more movement can make a difference. And if we're simply saying by railroading, 
you're too fat to even enter this service. What are we doing to that patient's mental health and internal value? Because if somebody said that to me, do you know what I'll do? I'd sit downstairs and open a family sized bag of crisps. So, 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 you know, what are we saying? And, and you can tell now that we're both on the soapboxes about this one, uh, because it really, really does frustrate us. And the research that's coming out is not only showing what we've always known, that obesity can cause lymphedema, but guess what, guys? Lymphedema is actually showing that it can cause obesity. So, you know, hey ho, this is another um, bow in our arrow to say that argument is fault. It's a fault from the start. Um, and therefore, we need to rethink the way that we come at this and making every contact count. You know, we're, we're, we're happy with that as a concept. But you know what? We are so privileged. We're so privileged to have people bear their entire soul to us about the things that matter to them. It is such a special relationship. And we can hopefully use our health promotional messages around getting more active, as you said, in an appropriate way for that individual, not a leotard on doing some Jane Funder, but appropriate messages. The British Infology Society's Everybody Can campaign, which Legs Matter have been hugely supportive of. It's all about doing something very small, making a change. Smoking cessation, I know with you from an arterial perspective, massively important to help our patients move forward. And the obesity um, crisis that's happening in our country does not allow us to wash our hands of people who have conditions that are associated with that and maybe even caused by that or, or a contributing factor. Touching on um, that uh, and um, the the disgrace that is services that won't accept people with wounds when you anatomically have demonstrated how you can't have one without the other either, um, which makes it even more of a nonsense. Thinking about that assessment of those patients, obese patients, patients with lymphedema, how do we get across the vascular assessment of these patients it's continually something that comes up and I know you can look at a leg with your x-ray specs and your experience and you can know whether something's safe to go ahead or not how, how do we do that as generalists okay so I think there's two parts to that Becky that I'd like to discuss with you the first off is the fear of compression of am I going to compress this leg and cause some damage can I just say to you all forget it uh, if, if the leg is edematous just put some compression on them. I am no fear whatsoever. Hang on. If there's a wound on the foot, be more fearful of it. It's more likely to be arterial disease. If the wound, if the leg is skinny and the patient's a heavy smoker and I had a stroke and there's no signs of venous disease, be cautious with it. But if you're showing a leg that's got edema on it and the wound is actually on the leg, remember the National Wound Care Strategy now says you can put 20 on that without any form of assessment. But truthfully, do I do ABPIs in patients like that? No, nope. I use the BLS document of the ABPI standard that basically, if you've got edema, you need compression and I will put it on. I think that we need to really think about this fear factor. Mm -hmm. If the patient's got intact sensation, if you put something on that's going to cut off their circulation, they're going to take it off. They're their own safety mechanism. So I think... From a vascular arterial compression point of view, lower your heckles. We don't care these days. If it's on the leg, get some compression on it. From a venous point of view, though, this is where we do get more excited and we want you to be part of our journey. Because for any patient with a venous ulcer, they may well have underlying venous disease. And even me, Becky, with my x-ray eyes, as you call it, <laughs> I can't assess for that. I need, an arter I need a venous duplex scan to assess for that. But we have to make sure that every patient out there has access to that venous duplex scan because let's go back to that capillary bed. If I could turn off the tap by a simple day case walk-in, walk-out procedure and I turn down that venous hypertension, well, that's going to really reduce that pressure of the capillary bed, really help the compression get rid of that lymphedema and therefore move that patient on. So every patient that's out there with an area of ulceration needs to be assessed with a venous duplex scan. And that's only accessible by referral into vascular. It's within the NICE guidelines. It's within the National Wound Care Strategy guidelines. We just need to think about how does that pathway work between us? And I would like that pathway to work that our nursing staff simply referring to our nursing teams locally to undergo that assessment. Mm. 
And I think you you said something there that's key because, you know, we, we don't know what you do, you know, in your specialist service. We, we don't understand the, 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 the nuances of the surgery, but you said it's day case. So therefore, it's suitable for people who we maybe wouldn't have thought it was suitable. Maybe somebody over the age of 70, you know, goodness me, um, you know, 70 oh, we, these we, days we is the new 50. Yeah, yeah, we operate on 90 people, no, no, over 90 wow. if you've got pain. Because, uh, Becky, it comes back down to which do you want? Do you want a treatment to cure them of their venous hypertension or do you want to palliate them yes. in compression hosiery? And, and actually, it doesn't matter. The health economics always works out. And if I asked you, Becky, if your mild edema was due to venous insufficiency, do you want to wear stockings for the rest of your life or would you like a day case procedure, walk in, walk out, minimally invasive, that's going to cure you of that? And actually, it may make that you never need to use compression again. I say that with a caveat. That's only for mild edema. If yeah. you've got moderate amount of edema, we should still operate on your veins because we're going to reduce the risk of deterioration in the future. Mm -hmm. But those patients are always going to need a degree of support going forward from compression. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, the thing. It, sh it should be us not not talking about, oh, you wouldn't need this, you know, in a tiny few cases, that might be the case. But it's a it's a joint thing. And I think, again, reducing that inflammation, reducing that risk of um, ulceration and reducing the risk of infection. You know, we know for lymphedema that the risk of cellulitis goes hand in hand. But you um, highlighted that those patients that we showed photos of earlier didn't have cellulitis. They actually had discoloration through that continued inflammatory process. So, again, I would just say to to people that's another thing to look out for as well as making sure that they um, refer patients into you in a timely fashion that they actually look at some of the resources that are out there the the legs matter endorsed bls red legs pathway as well to get that information and, and also look out for the new bls uh, uh, position paper on using compression hoser with uh, with proven dvt uh, which i believe is going to be launched at the bls conference later this year and um, another fantastic piece of work coming from the bls so, so just to, to, to wrap this up, really, I hope you've enjoyed um, this, this really um, informative co conversation. And I hope that what you've gained from this is actually sometimes me and Becky still struggle with elements of this. Um, I'm going to ask Becky in a minute what's her take home tip for all of you. I think my take home tip listening from Becky is stop going for off the shelf stockings. That should be a starting point from my point of view. I think actually the next one is admitting to the patients, here's your first pair of stockings. I might not get this right first time. And I think my other take home message is, Leanne, keep looking at the knee and the thigh. Think when do I need to take the compression hosiery further from below the knee? And um, so they're going to be my three take homes. But I'm sure if you're watching this, you might have had a whole A4 paper. And um, so, Becky, if I ask you, what would your take home messages me, me to this audience of what's the, the key important things for you. I think the key important things that have come out for me and my learning as well, and, and that's the important thing we're always learning, is that you're never too old to be referred for a vascular assessment. You might be suitable for a surgical day case procedure. Fantastic. Didn't know that. Um, secondly, that really there is that promotion of pain relief with compression and I don't think it's something that we talk about and I don't think it's something we promote we know people don't like taking painkillers this is a natural way of, of improving someone's symptoms so definitely the pain relief and also I think that um, bespoke is not always necessary however if we could afford it we generally would go down that route. So for our patients, they deserve the very best. So let's give them the best. Fantastic. Becky, thank you so much for joining me. You're an inspiration you. to me on uh, every time I talk to you. I hope you've all um, enjoyed this session. Please make sure you have a look on the Legs Matters um, uh, website. Please watch out for the Legs Matters Awareness Week that's coming up. We would love to see your creativity of your baking and your <laughs> colourfulness that you Last year, you turned uh, Twitter yellow for us, and I absolutely loved it. Thank you for taking your time. I know you're all watching this predominantly in your own time. Mm -hmm. uh, you're doing that because you're absolutely fantastic at your job. No matter what's happening across the NHS at this moment in time, I think nurses need to be very proud of the job that we are delivering. And there are many people, including myself, who's very grateful for the job that you do day from day in. So thanks again uh, for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the session and I'm going to hand you back now to Sam. Thanks again. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Leanne. And thank you to Becky as well. 
an absolutely fantastic session. I'm sure you'll all agree. Uh, you can really see the passion from both of you. Um, so a huge, huge thank you from us and I'm sure from all our audience as well. Um, another big thank you to everyone else for watching. Uh, we really appreciate you giving up your time to watch these sessions. So a big thank you to you. Uh, and finally, a, a huge thank you to ST for supporting this event. Um, so ST have a couple of uh, quick videos that we're going to show you now as well. Uh, the first one is on jobs confidence uh, as a potential solution to the problem, uh, the problems that have been discussed today. So uh, I'm going to pass over to that video now and I'll see you afterwards. So also picking up from uh, what Becky was saying during the session, uh, if you do want to get more information on the topics discussed today, as well as for the Teams calls and the videos, then you can get in touch with ST on concierge.service at st.com. Uh, there is also a new educational concept called PATH from ST. Uh, this will support with generic clinical education for the management of lower limb conditions. And uh, we're going to show you a short video for that as well now. Well, thank you again, everyone, for watching. Uh, the certificate link should now be on your screen. So uh, do download that certificate for your CPD. Uh, this recording and uh, all the slides will be on our website in the next 24 hours. So go and have a look at those there. Thank you again for joining. Thank you to Becky and Leanne. And a big thank you to ST. Make sure you're following our Facebook page so you, you never miss any of our events in the future. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.